This week on Arts Insight, the abstract expressions of Mark Rothko. And by setting up the environment for these uh, experiences, he masterfully controlled the viewer's response. A food photographer creates kitchen art. The artist makes their own rules. For me, I just kind of make my own rules. <laughs> the art of gaming. And the game industry just keeps growing and growing, and there's no short you know, creative people to come up with all the amazing ideas and content for games. And a printmaker who draws inspiration from nature. I keep hearing that you need to have a lot of courage in order to take a good looking piece of art and then cut it up. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Today we're back in the East End, the site of this weekend's Whatever Fest. Stay with us, you're going to learn all about whatever they're up to this year. But first, Mark Rothko was a legendary abstract artist with many works right here in Houston. A new retrospective on the artist is yet another reason that the area has become a destination for lovers of his art. Houston has a special relationship to Mark Rothko, and I feel like I myself have a special relationship with him, although I never met the great man. I was a teenager growing up in Houston when the Rothko Chapel was being constructed in the late 1960s and opened in 1971. And I was fascinated by architecture and contemporary art at the time, and everything about the chapel construction was of interest to me, and I snuck onto the site. I wanted to know everything I could. And then I was simply awestruck when the chapel finally opened, and I immediately wanted to incorporate this, this chapel, this place, into my life. And I can imagine, I imagine having a wedding there, I imagine having a funeral there. It was, to me, a place of importance. Now, 40 years later, looking back, you know, I can see that the opening of the Rothko Chapel was one of the most important developments in the history of Houston's cultural life. From the simplest kind of measurement, there are 14 magnificent murals, paintings by Mark Rothko. The chapel was opened in 1971. We're about ready to celebrate our 45th anniversary and soon are working now on the 50th anniversary. One of the things that people might not see first when they come in, but it's the spirits of all the people that have ever come in this building. It's something hard to describe, but if you think about what was built here, this wasn't built as an art museum. This wasn't built as a Mark Rothko gallery. It was built as a sanctuary, a place of pilgrimage, a place for people to come, a place of life and activity. So when you come in here and you realize you're sitting or standing or kneeling or whatever you're doing in a place that has hosted Nelson Mandela, Rigoberta Menchu, Nobel Peace Laureate, and people unknown from all corners of the world that may be on a similar journey or something different. That's another thing you encounter when you take the time to really come in and uh, be part of the fabric of the Rothko Chapel. Houston, therefore, has the place to go to fully understand the entire experience the artist wanted. And whenever you come in and look at our Rothkos, I always think it's great to go to the chapel first and get that notion because what Rothko didn't want was his work to be seen as decorative. He wanted it to be something that controlled space, that you sort of enter into the paintings, which is why he worked on such a large format. 
there's so much of participatory and experiential contemporary art which uh, can be found here in the Rothko exhibition. Well, the beauty of this exhibition is almost all the works, except for those from Houston Collections, the Menil, and our own Museum of Fine Arts Houston Collection, come from Rothko's estate. When he died, his heirs, the Rothko Foundation, gave about half of his extant work that remained in his studio, uh, 300 paintings and twice as many works on paper, to the National Gallery of Art. And they have been superb stewards of this collection. And unlike many of the Rothkos that one sees on the art market, these are in perfect condition, as well preserved as they could be given the frailty of the pigments and the canvases and the vicissitudes of time. And so many of our pictures in this exhibition have their original luminosity. And we can have any kind of emotion while we're in his thrall. We can be happy, we can be sad, we can be comforted and nurtured, we can be challenged and, and disturbed. And by setting up the environment for these uh, experiences, he masterfully controlled the viewer's response. But like all great art, it isn't activated until the viewer is there to participate and to engage with this work of art and have a symbiotic relationship with it. The retrospective is now open until January 24th. To find out more, visit mfah.org. So today we're here at Warehouse Live, one of the venues for Whatever Fest. So whatever is Whatever Fest, we're going to find out right now with event producer Jason Price. Hello, hello Jason. Hello, hello. Okay, the first question, Whatever is Whatever Fest? That's pretty much the theme, and uh, it's not just the theme, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> okay, great. That tells me nothing. So it's a music and comedy and art That's event. right. Yeah, yeah. Music and comedy, uh, 45 uh, bands and acts, 45 comedians, and uh, over 100 art vendors. Okay, why lump those three things together? What was the logic behind that? Uh, you know, I think Houston is craving something unique to showcase different facets of talent in the city. I've been a promoter for 15 years and had success at each little facet and just bringing it all together for the second year. So when you do something like that, I think a lot of people come because they want the concert. Do you find that the comedy plays as well as the concert in this kind of a venue? Yeah, it actually, it actually plays together nicely. A lot of comedians these days, you know, they're part of pop culture, and they enjoy the bands just as much as the bands enjoy being around them. Yeah. It's a great time of year to do an outdoor event, and it will be yeah. indoor and outdoor and all of the fun stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Why did you move it? Uh, well, last year, so we are in Texas, and it was August, and <laughs> as we recapped everything, that was the absolute first thing. It really seems like the week before Thanksgiving is just a magical time. People are taking a collective sigh of relief and looking forward to the holidays and kind of winding down. We want to be a part of that. Okay, so looking forward to what? What are we going to see this year? The headliner on Saturday is Ghostland Observatory. Headliner on Sunday is Metric. Overall, we have six stages and the comedy tent. Headliners for comedy are T.J. Miller from Silicon Valley, Doug Benson, and 45 other top comedians. So what are you most looking forward to? I'm, lo I'm looking forward to the comedy. Um, I'm looking forward to a few of the different elements. Uh, Ghostland Observatory's production is absolutely amazing. It's a laser experience, and uh, we bought on a 65-foot Ferris wheel this year that will overlook downtown Houston, but it'll be shined right, uh, the, the lasers from the stage at Ghostland Observatory will be shining right at the Ferris wheel. So I'm going to take a ride on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's so much. Why is it important to have this here in Houston, do you think? I think it's, I mean, Houston is, Houston is a growing metropolis. Um, it is a great place to live. The economy's good. Uh, in past years, entertainment options had been a little bit low. Um, overall, you know, as far as festivals, uh, different eclectic festivals, um, happy to kind of bring that together and give, you know, give Houston an, uh, an annual event, again, that will grow, but just be part of Houston and honor Houston in many ways. I if think. people want to find out the schedules and find out more online, where can they go? Yeah, it's uh, HoustonWhateverFest.com, HoustonWhateverFest.com. Do you have to type it in twice or just once? No, nope, just <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Ernie. Now, whenever you see a picture of food in a magazine, I'm sure it makes you pretty hungry. But that's not by chance. One Milwaukee photographer works very hard at making his images appetizing. The 
textures and the smells and I mean the lighting it just it just speaks to me it makes me happy I it puts a smile on my face my name is Grace Natoli Sheldon I am a food photographer and I live in Milwaukee I'm a food photographer slash prop stylist. A food stylist is more of the person that will cook the food for you, so I work with a lot of food stylists. I'm a prop stylist or a set stylist and a food photographer. Kind of all mixed it into one. I actually went to photo school to MITC. The art class that I took happened to be photography. And um, I liked it and I continued on with that. But while I was shooting, you know, for my classes, I was always shooting food. Every, all the teachers would tease me because it was like, if we were shooting symmetry, I'd have apples lined up in a row or, you know, if we were, whatever we were shooting, it was food related. So I always knew that I would shoot food. Kitchen art is a thing I started years ago, I'm probably 35 years ago. It's art for kitchens. It's still life's of food. It can be anything. For me, it's usually fruits and vegetables, and, and you know, like, I love vintage um, silverware and vintage plates and lots of metal and cool, you know, right now all that repurposed wood is so hot, so it, that speaks to me. Um, so that's what kitchen art. It's just a pretty image of food or food-related items that you would hang in your kitchen. Normally, I like, like to bring it home and put it in my own setting and you know, have my cool surfaces and my cool silverware. I'm all about the props. I love cloth, I love linens, and actually a lot of the stuff is left over from, from my family members too. I use a lot of my mother's dishes, a lot of, and my mother-in-law has great props. Like all the silverware is from my mother-in-law's house. A lot of my kitchen artwork is, is backlit. There, it's a lot of, you know, bright colors and light and airy. I don't really have it figured out when I start, but as I'm going, then I kind of, it kind of evolves. I've created a piece called Winter Harvest. For me, it's a more modern take on food photography. I started with the big things. I started with like a chunk of kale and some beets. It's not sitting on a piece of slate. It's a beautiful surface and food looks awesome on it. What I do is I just start setting things down and then I take a shot, see what I think, move it around, change the light. The light, it's all about the light to me. It's how the light hits the subject. I move the light around a lot. You have to be patient. You have to be light to putts. You have to like, you know, I move, you know, a piece of garlic a quarter of an inch and then I take a picture and then it's like, ugh, and then I put it back. And so it's all about the, the composition and it's all about the lighting and how it's falling. And then, and then I go back and think, oh, that's too contrasty or that's too not contrasty enough. But then there is the, the digital darkroom, the Photoshop and all of that stuff. Time gets away from you. For me, I can spend a lot of time finessing, you know, the contrast and the saturation of the colors and just certain colors. And so there's a lot of editing that goes in, at least for me, I like to play with that, have my final result. You know, it's always just a work in progress. So that's the challenge is just being patient and just taking your time. And, and for me, it's fun. So it's, it's not challenging. The kitchen art I do for myself, it's, it's, you know, it's what speaks to me, what, you know, what I love, I light it the way I want to light it, that sort of thing. The commercial work is I work for somebody. I work for a client that has a, um, a product. So the difference is I still, you know, light it and I do everything and it's wonderful, but it's to their specifications. You have to be actually true to the, to the product, but it still, it still evokes the same feeling in me. It's still beautiful. I still enjoy it. It's great. The artist makes their own rules. For me, I just kind of make my own rules. <laughs> as long as I'm true to the product. It's kind of just in me, you know, I just kind of do what comes, comes to me naturally. People just say, you know, oh, I could just eat that or I just want to lift it off the page. And it's, it's how I feel. So it's nice that I'm getting other people to feel exactly how I'm feeling with my art because really I'm doing it for me. And the fact that other people enjoy it too, that's like, 
icing on the cake. For more, visit gnsphoto.com. From Milwaukee to Laguna Beach and Laguna College of Arts and Design, we meet students who are given an extensive foundation in the digital arts, from game art and digital media to textile and action sports design. It's a design course with its eyes on the future. I mean, I just got out of the room now talking to a student with her ideas for a game and some of the most fresh and original things I've heard of, you know, in a long time. When looking at student work, there's a couple different parts of it. There's the technical craftsmanship of being able to concept design a character or 3D model a character that would go in the game and use, you know, to create on a computer. But then there's sort of that underlying creative instinct that they might have. An instinct that's bursting beyond the gaming department. Senior Jessica Neckor uses her talents in digital media to raise consumer awareness about the clothing and retail industry. Inspired by the 2013 factory collapse in Bangladesh, Jessica created an app. So the app is called Threadbare and you could go to a store, take your phone, and then scan the barcodes and then it would tell you the ratings of the different aspects about a company, like their sustainability, their workers' rights, and all of that. So it would give customers an option and uh, more insight into the companies that they're supporting. Julian Lozano's latest shoe design pays homage to his immigrant parents and their search for the American dream. I made a shoe line that's taking like Mexican embroidery for, on like leather garments and I'm pretty much placing it on the shoe. An art school in a seaside artist community, the Laguna College of Art and Design, or LCAD, has called Laguna Canyon home since 1961. It's a very small school. Uh, for the longest time, no one had really heard about us. And small it has remained, but what the founding fathers of the 60s could not have predicted is LCAD's flourishing majors in game art, design and digital media, textile and action sports design. Working partnerships with heavyweights from DreamWorks, Vans, Hurley, Nike, and Blizzard Entertainment keep the fickle nature of the industry on point. We have fabulous faculty. First of all, they, they have street cred, and the students appreciate that. Traditional studies in sculpture, illustration, drawing, and painting remain well represented, but much of LCAD's strength lie in its fearless following of applied arts and trends. Ideally, I think that when they graduate, they want to get a job working in game development video game development, right, as an artist. So that can involve being a concept designer, an environment designer, 3D modeling artist, or animator. Right now, games, there's so much that goes into creating them, and there's you need to have a certain skill level of, in traditional foundation art skills along with the technical requirements. And the game industry just keeps growing and growing, and there's no shortage of need for you know creative people to come up with all the amazing ideas and content for games. For LCAD students, the job search starts almost as soon as the acceptance letter is signed. The tech-savvy students find a voice for their unbound enthusiasm with guidance from industry pedigreed veterans. Once on campus, it's easy to see that life in Laguna is sometimes inspiration in itself. I do textile design, so um, my project last year was totally inspired by my painting on surfboards, um, a lot of florals, so um, I uh, created some shoes with floral patterns, uh, kind of like Hawaiian floral patterns, and then I also did apparel to go along with it. I'm actually designing a wetsuit right now, so I'm doing like a Vans Starfish, that's the name of my wetsuit line. As the creative wheels turn within the walls of LCAD, practical application happens just outside the canyon, well before the students get their diploma. So they really have to understand the design, the business, and then also what the world's doing and to be ready to step into that, that scenario. Three interns every three months skate through the doors of Vans corporate headquarters in Orange County, a partnership that is beneficial for both the college and the skate giant. Because we're a small team and it's a small group, it's very personal. Uh, it's an instant uh, bonding with them and bringing them into the team. They become an, a one of us, they become just an extension of our team producing and working with us alongside. It's not a, you know, it's we're dependent somewhat on them and their creativity to bring new ideas and fresh ideas. And the LCAD group has consistently been a really creative group for us to 
utilize as a resource. And knowing that even the most innovative work environment can benefit from a fresh perspective is just good business and an unexpected payoff. I think sometimes we become jaded in it as we're always producing stuff and you don't realize how excited, you know, when they see that it's ending up in a catalog, you know, or they see that, you know, when we get the sample, you know, and they're seeing the actual physical sample for the first time, uh, you know, you kind of get to live through that again through them, which is always awesome. For more information, visit lcad.edu. And finally tonight, printmaker Lou Stovall has lived and worked in Washington, D.C. since he arrived there in the early 60s. At 78, he is still producing stunning prints that showcase the beauty of nature. I arrived in Washington, D.C. in 1962 and found that it was just a wonderful place. Lou Stovall is a passionate and prolific printmaker who has called the district his home since he arrived to study art at Howard University. There was something welcoming about the environment, the atmosphere, and I decided after the second day that I would stay here. As the civil rights movement grew in the early 60s, Lou found his skills as a poster maker in high demand. Making the civil rights posters, uh, you know, saw myself as kind of a street artist, you know, made the posters as fast as I could because whoever was asking for them wanted them because they wanted to be out on the street with them. When those posters were done, uh, they were done, you know, we didn't save them. Lou's artistic inspiration has always been rooted in organic forms. Growing up in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, before I came to Washington, I had this total love of landscape and trees and that kind of thing. And I never really uh, liked drawing people because I'm primarily a nature uh, person. Um, the trees in D.C. really turned me on, in addition to all kinds of architecture around Washington. In 1968, Lou decided to turn his workshop into a collaborative learning environment for the community. Well, for a long time, uh, one of the things that I did was open my studio to anyone who wanted to work with silkscreen printmaking. I had a relationship with the Corcoran Gallery where uh, students could come and learn how to make silkscreen prints. Uh, and all the people who wanted to come and learn silkscreen, for me, the trade-off was you had to teach a kid. So whatever students wanted to learn, there was some adult artist there to teach them. is a time-intensive process that often yields unexpected results. And it's just a matter of running color and seeing how it looks. And then when it dries, I'll either add to it or I can probably delete some of it, you know, by scraping it off. It's just free expression, that's all. The beauty of uh, working the way that I work is that I never know what I'm going to come up with, so when it's abstract, it's the discovery that's most important. Lou has experimented with a number of media throughout his career and has recently been developing a series of abstract three-dimensional pieces. Over the years, the changes that I've had where art was concerned was going from representation to abstraction and I much prefer the abstraction. And I found myself going back and forth to the uh, abstract images over a period of time until I finally went totally abstract. I keep hearing that you need to have a lot of courage in order to take a good looking piece of art and then cut it up. And I thought, I've got a lot of courage. <laughs> you know, I can do that. So I started cutting the, uh, the prints up, but I'm also kind of a formalist. So I made sure that everything was in, 
and square and cut consistently. You know, I try to make everything beautiful um, and challenging. So I'm, I'm always hoping that when someone sees something of mine uh, that I've done, that they'll want more. You know, but also that it'll inspire them to do some of their own. For more information, visit lewstovall.com. And that does it for us on this episode of Arts Insight. Make sure and join us next week as we continue to explore the world of art from right outside your door to across the country. From all of us here at Houston Public Media and Whatever Fest, I'm Ernie Manus. Thanks for watching and have a great week. Thank you.